Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 395. I'm the host, Kyle Anslone. A lot of news to get to today. Just want to ask everybody to share the show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute. We repost the show on the blog at antiwar.com. If you'd like to watch the show, we post the video version uh, on YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey. It's up everywhere you could listen to podcasts on all the podcatchers. So if you're new to the show, subscribe. If you've been a listener for a while, just recommend the show to somebody new. We really appreciate it. Let's get into it. First story up today. GOP leaders blast Biden's $886 billion military budget as inadequate. Republican leadership in Congress has blasted President Biden's massive $886 billion budget request for 2024 as inadequate, even as House GOP members claim they want to cap uh, spending, a Defense News report on Friday. House Republicans favor a plan to cap discretionary spending for the Fiscal year 2024 at 2022 levels, but military spending accounts for nearly half the discretionary spending each year, and few Republicans favor rolling back the Pentagon budget. A budget that proposed to increase non-defense spending at more than twice the rate of defense is absurd, Mike Rogers. Uh, He's a Republican from Alabama and the chairman of the Armed Services Committee said in a statement in response to Biden's request, the president's Uh, incredibly misplaced priorities send all the raw messages to our adversaries. Senator Roger Wickers, a Republican from Mississippi, the ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, called the Biden request woefully inadequate. Representative Kevin Calvert, a Republican from California, the chair of the House Appropriations Committee's defense panel, said Biden was prioritizing misguided domestic spending and partisan priorities over our war fighting needs. The comments are a sign that, like in previous years, Congress will likely add tens of billions of dollars to Biden's military spending request. For the 2023 fiscal year, Biden requested $813 billion, but Congress added $45 billion, bringing the total for the National Defense Authorization Act to $858 billion. For the 2022 spending level, Biden asked for $753 billion, but was handed nearly $778 billion. So this is one of those things where I would really hope that once this bill got into Congress, there'd be so much debate between the Republicans and Democrats, they will ultimately have to cut portions of this to get it passed. But the the opposite tends to happen, that more and more pork is stuck into this bill with the idea that it will get any representatives who are maybe hesitant about signing on to get on board because it's going to, you know, provide jobs to their congressional district, uh, you know, through the the federal defense (laughs) subsidy, which I do oppose. You know, I I don't think they create that many jobs, certainly that not that many good jobs. A lot of the times, you know, this money is really kept in the Washington, D.C. area. But, uh, you know, they convince these Democrats, Republicans, whoever, you know, hey, if you you don't vote for this bill, then we're not going to have enough ships and we're going to have to close the shipyard and we're in duty in your district, things like that. And they know that that will be used against them come re-election time. So almost all these representatives just sign on uh, to the bill at the end because, you know, they see it in their own political interest, even if it's not in the interest of the country. Now, <laughs> the biggest news here, of course, is $886 billion is probably the size of the nest, what, 10 or so countries combined in in terms of defense spending and uh, likely all those countries except Russia, China, and possibly Iran, who made the top 10, do not, uh, are U.S. allies. So, you know, we're talking about countries like the U.K., France, Saudi Arabia, countries very close to the U.S., you know, Saudi Arabia, we're helping them fight a war in Yemen, and yet we're concerned that we're not spending enough on our military. You know, this this should raise some massive red flags in Washington, and, you know, why can't our military-industrial complex outdo the Chinese and the Russian military-industrial complex for the, the same amount of money, right? So China spends two-something, Russia spends 60, probably 100-something now, so I mean, you know, this budget is essentially double or more of our, you know, two 
what what the Pentagon would label our near peer competitors, right? The the Washington establishment. They're worried about Russia and China. Well, we spend twice as much as them on defense. Why is it that America has to spend so much more on defense? Why is our military industrial complex so inadequate, so incompetent, so unable to produce quality weapons that we had to dump all this money into it? Uh, but in fact, Congress looks at it the other way that we're not spending enough money. We need more, 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 more. Of course, you know, increase the State Department budget, get some diplomacy going here, and we could probably bring the the, the you know defense budget down to something far, far more reasonable. Uh, cut it in half or a lot more in the coming years. Next up, I have another story on Havana syndrome today, and and this was shocking to me. I checked the date on the political article several times to make sure it was correct. So the Department of Defense will spend $750,000 inducing Havana syndrome in animals and illness the intelligence community cannot prove exists. The Department of Defense granted Wayne State University three quarters of a million dollars to attempt to get Barrett's Havana syndrome. Earlier this month, the intelligence community concluded that illness is not caused by a weapon. And uh, I wrote this article for the Libertarian Institute yesterday, March 12th. Now, just a a quick background on Havana Syndrome. American officials in Havana, Cuba, reported hearing loud noises and experiencing seeing headaches in late 2016. Once the Donald Trump administration came into power in 2017, the White House claims the symptoms were caused by a mysterious weapon directed at the American officials. Trump would go on to roll back the increased diplomatic and economic ties his predecessor, Barack Obama, put in place with Cuba. A scientific analysis of the noise alleged to be sonic weapons was dismissed as the sound of local crickets. In 2020, Julia Ioffe wrote an article that was published in GQ alleging American officials in Russia were coming under attack from the same weapon that was used in Cuba. Ioffe claimed Moscow was behind the attacks on American citizens. After that story dropped, dozens of American officials around the world claimed to be victims of Havana Syndrome. Congress passed funding to compensate the victims. The intelligence officials who spoke with Ioffe and members of Congress ignored a 2018 report by a scientific board that's compiled by the U.S government by the way this is the jason uh, group of scientists so i think it's the state department maybe uh found the alleged systems experienced by victims were not caused by microwave or ultrasound weapons and essentially the conclusion of that report was that these symptoms were psychosomatic that or or just you know things that occur as a part of normal everyday life and were misattributed to Havana syndrome so People get headaches. People get migraines. I get migraines quite frequently. I don't think I ever came under the attack of a direct energy weapon or anything like that causing my migraines, right? Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is they ask people, they're like, oh, I don't feel like I'm as mentally sharp as I was in the past. Well, you know, a lot of these people that they're talking to who are getting these benefits are 40, 50 years old. And so, you know, that's at the, at the point where you've reached your cognitive peak and likely are going to start experiencing some decline. And so, if your memory isn't as sharp, if you're not as maybe quick-witted as you were in the past, this isn't because of a direct energy weapon. It's because you're getting older. And yeah, I think a lot of these kind of symptoms were misattributed to uh, Havana syndrome. So next up, in 2022, the CIA concluded the supposed phenomenon was the result of a sustained uh, was uh, not the result of a sustained global campaign by a hostile power. Two weeks ago, the Washington Post reported another assessment from five intelligence uh, uh, um, five intelligence agencies concluding that Havana syndrome was highly unlikely to be the work of a foreign power. And so we have all these studies carried out by the U.S. government over the course of the past five, six, seven years that have... None of them have pointed to anything suggesting that this weapon exists, that there's anything remotely going on with Havana syndrome that is true. And yet uh, the Pentagon is sponsoring an animal testing project that will move forward in the face of several U.S. government findings that Havana syndrome does not exist. Political report, the grant was awarded in September, but confirmed the Department of Defense will not rescind it. The Pentagon hopes the Wayne State uh, researchers will use the 750,000 to mimic the symptoms of Havana syndrome. The study will develop and test a novel laboratory animal model to mimic mild concussive head injury. The DOD spokesperson 
Tim Gorman told Politico, behavioral imaging and historical studies will determine if the model is comparable to the abnormalities we see in human following concussive head injuries. And so uh, a couple, I think, layers where this is important is one, if they are looking at trying to do this, then, you know, it, it can be one of those situations where they, they could actually be developing a, leve- a, a weapon kind of on the down low and claim, oh, you know, we're just trying to research an illness. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's part of what's going on here. The testing of this on ferrets is disgusting. You know, I'm not a particularly big animal rights activist. I got two dogs. I really like my dogs. Uh, but at the same time, I do think if you're going to test anything on an animal, you have to have a pretty good reason to do it. it, it if this disease, if this, is, you know, Havana syndrome is fake, you got to have some kind of evidence that it's actually real before you're going to subject all these poor animals uh, to this. But, you know, the, the U.S. government doesn't have any interest in that. And so, you know, there's a lot of important stuff going on here. I will say I did hear some testimony from Avril Haines, who's the director of national intelligence, who I think tried to downplay the the recent report that came out saying that there's no evidence and it's highly unlikely uh, that, that the Havana syndrome was caused by a foreign power. All right, let's move on here and talk about what's happening in Ukraine. All right, this from Dave DeCamp, published at Antiwar.com on March 9th. Russia launches barrage of missile strikes across Ukraine. Russia launched a series of missile strikes across Ukraine on Thursday in one of the heaviest Russian bombardment in weeks. The strikes targeted energy infrastructure and the Ukrainian Prime Minister Denise Shimyal said the Power facilities were hit in eight regions of Ukraine. Generation and distribution facilities in eight regions have been damaged, he said on Telegram. Ukrainian authorities said the strikes also hit residential buildings and since people were reported killed. Moscow said the strikes also targeted Ukrainian military facilities. The Russian defense minister said the strikes were launched in retaliation over an attack in Russia uh, in a region that borders Ukraine. The defense minister said... The hypersonic missiles were used in the bombardment in response to terror attacks carried out by the Kiev regime in Russia on March 2nd. The Russian armed forces delivered a massive retaliatory strike, long range air, sea and ground uh, based high precision weapons, including hypersonic missiles, hit key Ukrainian military infrastructure sites, enterprises of the military industrial complex and related energy facilities. Moscow accused Russian, uh, uh, excuse me, Moscow accused Ukrainian saboteurs of killing two Russian civilians inside of Russia, which Kiev has denied. A group known as the Russian Volunteer Corps that's fighting for Ukraine took responsibility for the raid. The group's leader, said he was unaware of the casualties and claimed the attack was carried out with the support of the Ukrainian government. According to the Financial Times, the leader of the group is considered an extremist and has ties to neo-Nazi and white nationalists across the Western world. The Russian Volunteer Corps is a part of Ukraine's territorial territorial defense forces that was formed in 2022 it's also made up of Russians who have been fighting for Ukraine since 2014 including former members of the neo-nazi azov russian according to unheard elements of the group are overtly sympathetic to neo-nazi ideology and praise hitler on telegram all right the next story i have from decamp here is very important u.s ukraine unity is cracking apart over a year since Russia launched its evasion of Ukraine, there are growing differences between Washington and Kiev on how to move forward in the conflict. Over One issue over Bakhmut, the eastern city, Ukrainian city, where Russian and Ukrainian forces have been locked in a battle for over eight months. The Biden administration thinks Ukraine has expended too many resources defending Bakhmut and worries it will impact their ability to launch a counteroffensive this spring. But officials in Kiev had decided to keep fighting for this city. Another point of contention is over Crimea, as the Ukrainian president insists they will retake the peninsula, which has been under Russia control in 2014, and is populated by people who are happy to be part of the Russian Federation. While some Biden administration officials have vowed to support Ukrainian attacks on Crimea, 
The political report said other U.S. officials believe Zelensky's insistence that there will be no peace talks until the peninsula is taken will only prolong the war. But publicly, President Biden and other officials maintain that negotiations will only happen under Kiev's terms. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has also acknowledged the risk of escalation that would come with the Ukrainian attempt on Crimea, calling it a red line for the Russian president, and said the Pentagon it's unlikely Kiev can take the peninsula. The U.S. also appears to be tired of Zelensky's constant demands for weapons. Two White House officials told Politico there are grumblings in Washington over Zelensky's constant requests and lack of gratitude. Despite the massive amount of support provided by the U.S. and its allies, Ukrainian officials have frequently said it's not enough and are demanding fighter jets and longer-range missiles. The Politico report mentioned the Nord Stream sabotage and how U.S. officials are linking the attack to Ukraine while insisting Ukrainian government was not involved, but the vague claims are likely an attempt to shift blame from the U.S. following a bombshell report by investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch that alleged President Biden ordered the bombing of the pipelines. Publicly, Biden still maintains he will support Ukraine for as long as it takes, but there are other signs the U.S. is winding down its support. CIA Director William Burns visited Kiev in January and told Zelensky that Congress might not pass any more massive aid packages for the war. Ukrainian officials are concerned that the Biden administration might use Congress as an excuse to scale down assistance. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Bakhmut here. Uh, the head of the Russian Wagner Group, the Russian mercenary outfit, said Sunday that fighting in the eastern city of Bakhmut is growing fiercer as Ukrainians uh, keep pouring troops in to defend the area. The situation in Bakhmut is very difficult, very difficult, with enemy fighting for each meter. And the closer we are approaching the city center, the fiercer the fighting is growing, the more artillery tank being used uh, against us. The head of the Wagner group said Ukraine is simply supplying endless reserves, but insisted Wagner fighters would keep moving forward since mid January. Rush Wagner and the Russian regular forces have been making gains around Bakhmut and recently took the eastern district of the small city, which has a pre war population of 70,000. Also on Sunday, Zelensky claimed Russia had suffered a 1,100 dead troops in just a week of fighting for Bakhmut, but that number is not verified. Zelensky is justifying his decision to keep fighting for the city by claiming that Russia is suffering massive casualties, attempting to capture it. While the exact number on both sides are unknown, it's clear Ukraine is taking heavy casualties in the city. German intelligence estimated in January that Ukraine is losing hundreds of soldiers each day in the brutal battle. Ukrainian troops are is said to be uh, calling the front a meat grinder in Bakhmut and have little training support or weapons. So those are the updates I have for you, uh, Ukraine today. I'm not sure if by the time we get to Tuesday's show, there'll be a major update over Bakhmut or it's just going to be uh, this slow kind of grind where Russia continues to take you know, a kilometer at a time in and around this city and, you know, at the cost of hundreds of lives probably for each kilometer. But, you know, that's the, the fighting level that's going on. If you're watching, by the way, there's a nice map up here where you could kind of see how uh, close to surrounded Russia now has the city. All right. Now let's move on to Taiwan, where I have some, I think, some pretty bad news. Director of National Intelligence Haynes says China should know the U.S. is willing to defend Taiwan. The Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haynes, said Thursday that China should know the U.S. is willing to go to war over Taiwan, pointing to comments made by President Biden that he would defend the island in the event of a Chinese attack. Haynes made the remarks at a House Intelligence Committee hearing when asked by Representative Chris Stewart, a Republican from Utah if she thinks the U.S. should change its policy of strategic ambiguity over the questioning of defending Taiwan. I think it's clear to the Chinese what our position is based on the president's comments. So we've had, I think, Biden four times in his presidency say that the U.S. would go to war with Taiwan. But at least in the first two times, the, the White House did walk that back. Because the U.S. policy for China, uh, the, the one 
uh, the one China policy. This is how the U.S. and China are supposed to kind of maintain the relationship. Uh, recognizes that you know the the Chinese political entity, the borders of China include the island of Taiwan, and that there should be one government for the the whole thing, mainland China and Taiwan. Now, I think the U.S. would would like to you know say that it should be the Taiwanese government, while of course the Chinese are you know mainland says that would be the government in Beijing. So in September 2022. President Biden was asked that the American men and women should be deployed to Taiwan if China attacked, and he replied yes. Unlike previous times, he made the com uh, comment the White House did not walk it back. Kirk Campbell, the Biden's top Asia official on the National Security Council, said at the time the president's comments speak for themselves. Um, so I think there are a lot of questions, though, when Biden says something, even on foreign policy, how much he actually means it and how much he's just being Joe Biden, speaking off the cuff, saying things that he either shouldn't say or actually aren't true. Uh, whatever way it is, it's obviously problematic. And this is something that Joe Biden realizes in 2002 when he was a senator. Uh, President Bush made a statement saying that the U.S. would defend Taiwan, greatly upsetting China. And Biden penned an op-ed, I believe it was in the Washington Post, uh, you know, telling the president that words matter. And, you, you know, you can't just ramble off the policy the wrong way. You really do have to get it right. So, you know, that's really important. And Biden knows that. But yet the U.S. continues to say that we're, we're going to go to war and defend China, but uh, to, for, to defend Taiwan. But I think Avril Haines saying this makes it feel a lot more like official policy than Biden saying it. Now, that's absurd because Biden is the president. But uh, again, just who Joe Biden is, who Avril Haines is, how the administration works, that might be the uh, a part of this is, is that. You know, this is officially changing the one China policy here uh, is essentially what we have Avril Haines doing. Uh, the Biden administration officials and assists there hasn't been an official change in policy on the issue, but have made it clear, unlike in Ukraine, Biden would directly intervene with troops in Taiwan uh, to fight China despite the risk of nuclear war. Haines said that the hearing... It's not our assessment that China wants to go to war over Taiwan. Beijing's stance is that it sees peaceful reunification with Taiwan, but doesn't rule out the use of force. China has been increasing military pressure on Taiwan, direct response to the U.S. stepping up support for the island. Chinese officials have warned if the U.S. doesn't change policies in the region, it will lead to conflict and confrontation. Now, one thing I'm not sure that the U.S. is really accounting for here is what Beijing is going to do. Let's say they blockade the island. Are we going to shoot our way through that blockade if the Chinese forces aren't shooting at the Taiwanese forces and essentially kick off the shooting war? I mean, it, we're talking about a lot of very complicated, very escalatory decisions here that, that the White House is floating and it, it could get very dangerous very fast. Another article from Dave DeCamp here, U.S. Pacific commander says U.S. forces on uh, must focus on sinking Chinese ships in future war. The head of the United States Pacific Air Force said Wednesday that the U.S. needs to focus on sinking Chinese ships in a potential conflict with China as U.S. military leaders are speaking more bluntly about dread war with Beijing despite the risk of it turning nuclear. General Kevin Kenneth Willsbish Bach, uh, Wills Bach said that the need to focus on sinking ships was the lesson from China's response to the former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visiting Taiwan in August. The trip provoked the largest ever military drills around the island, which simulate a blockade. So I guess, you know, this general is saying that what we need to do is get ready to shoot our way through a Chinese blockade of Taiwan. This is this is just crazy. Now, one more quick story here on China. U.S. Navy wants to turn Australia into full service submarine hub. The U.S. Navy wants a full service submarine hub in Australia that can oversee all underwater activity in the Asia Pacific, including production or repairs. Defense News report on Thursday. The report 
cited comments from Navy Secretary Carlos del Toro, whose vision will be possible under AUKUS, the military pad signed by the U.S., Britain, and Australia in 2021 as part of an effort to build up alliances against China. AUKUS focuses on technology sharing that will give Australia access to American and British nuclear-powered submarines. Del Toro said AUKUS is about being able to repair our submarines much further out, being able to build them in Australia to uh, well, as well, too, and create much more presence in the Asia Pacific where we need it the most. President Biden and Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albizi and British Prime Minister Rashi Sunak are expected to unveil details of the AUKUS submarine deals on Monday during a meeting aboard a submarine in San Diego. Australia is expected to purchase its first American Virginia class attached submarine, which will be delivered by the early 2030s. Australia will then purchase a new British designed submarine called the SSN. Dash AUKUS that's expected to arrive in the 2040s. The ultimate goal is for Australia to be able to build its own SSN. And dash AUKUS submarines with U.S. or British provided nuclear propulsion over the next few decades. Canberra is expected to spend over 100 billion on the plan. Uh, Canberra, and then the submarines Australia will acquire are not expected to be armed with nuclear weapons, but that could always change. Either way, China views the submarine buildup as a provocation, since the underwater craft will be used to patrol the waters of the South China Sea. The U.S. also has plans to deploy more troops and aircraft to Australia as a part of its buildup, including nuclear-capable B-52 bombers. All right, let's uh, let's get into some good news now. I wrote this for the uh, antiwar.com on March 10th. Iran, Saudi Arabia will normalize ties under agreement brokered by China. Iranian and Saudi state media announced a new agreement that Tehran and Riyadh will normalize relations under an agreement brokered by China. The deal between the Middle East rivals come after America interfered uh, interference in talks. After several days of intensive negotiations between Iran and Saudi Arabia's national security advisor, an agreement was reached on Friday aimed at resuming relations between the two countries, Iranian state media wrote. Saudi state media affirmed the Iranian report with a press release. Beijing, Tehran, and Riyadh announced that an agreement has been reached between the Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. That includes an agreement to resume diplomatic relations between them and reopen their embassies and missions within a period of not exceeding two months. It continued, they also agree that the ministers of foreign affairs of both countries shall meet to implement this and arrange for their ambassadors and discuss means of enhancing bilateral relations. The deal also includes a commitment by Iran and Saudi Arabia and China to make every effort to strengthen international peace and security. The agreement calls for Tehran and Riyadh to respect each other's sovereignty. Additionally, Saudi Arabia and Iran agreed to implement accords that were signed in 1998 and 2000. One was a security agreement. One was more of a cultural agreement. You know, we're going to play sports together, stuff like that. Uh, more diplomacy and other important stuff, too. Uh, the talks between Tehran and Riyadh occurred in Beijing this week, and the deal was inked during a ceremony on Friday. China's most senior foreign policy official, Wang Yi, celebrated the signing as a victory. This is a victory for dialogue, a victory for peace. This is a major positive news for the world, which is currently so tur turbulent and restive. It sends a clear signal, he said. Tehran and Riyadh cut ties in 2016 after Saudi Arabia carried out the execution of a prominent Shia cleric. This resulted in protesters storming the Saudi embassy in Iran, provoking the end of ties between the two nations. Tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia have been inflamed by other conflicts in the Middle East and Syria and Iraq. Saudi Arabia backed extremist forces and Iran backed the armies of Damascus and Baghdad. In Yemen, Riyadh has fought a war against the Houthis for nearly a decade. Saudi Arabia claims the Houthis are a proxy force of Iran. However, Riyadh and its supporters in Washington have failed to prevent present credible efforts, evidence that 
Tehran provides any significant support to the Houthis. In late 2019, Saudi Arabia sought to improve relations with Iran. Baghdad attempted to foster diplomacy between its two neighbors. Iranian General Qasem Soleimani arrived at the Baghdad airport on January 3rd with a diplomatic message for Saudi Arabia when he was killed by an American or- drone strike ordered by then-President Donald Trump. Soleimani's death ended negotiations until 2021. Trita Parsi, executive vice president of the Quincy Institute, said the deal was good news. The agreement is good news for the Middle East since Saudi Saudi Iranian tensions have been the driver of instability in the region, Parsi told the New York Times. Foreign policy analysts from more hawkish think tanks had a different reaction. Mark Dubowitz, the executive director of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, called the deal a lose-lose-lose for American interests. Mohammed Khalid al Ahai, a senior fellow at the Huston Institute and fellow at the Belfer Center, told the New York Times that this is a reflection of China's growing strategic clout in the region, the fact that it has a lot of leverage over the Iranians, and the fact that it has a deep and important economic relationship with the Saudis. All right, so obviously this deal is a huge a huge step forward uh, in the Middle East. Hopefully it will actually mean uh, Saudi Ar- Arabia and Iran do less to fuel conflicts in other countries. Um, well, I don't want to be both sides on it because <laughs> there is a difference between Saudi Arabia supporting uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and then Iran supporting the Iraqi government that the U.S. built. However, you know, th- this has fueled a lot of tensions and a lot of conflict in the region. So normalization of relations is probably good news. However, y- you know, Washington isn't going to like this and Tel Aviv isn't going to like this. One of the main things that the U.S. has been trying to do in the Middle East is foster normalization agreements between Israel and other Arab states in an effort to build up, uh, you know, essentially a block against Iran. And, and this seems to be a major setback, not having the, the Saudis is in on that. And so Dave DeCamp writes on March 12th, Israeli officials say Saudi Arabia, Iran deal, the result of U.S. weakness. A senior Israeli official told reporters on Friday that the normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran was a result of weakness by the U.S. and previous Israeli government. There was a feeling of U.S. and Israeli weakness, and this is why the Saudi Saudi started looking for new avenues. It's clear that this was going to happen, the unnamed official said while traveling with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Rome. The official said the Saudi Iran deal, which was brokered by China, should not impact Israel's efforts to normalize with Riyadh, but a major aspect of Israel's plans to open up relationships with the Gulf state was to form an anti-Iran alliance in the region, which seems more unlikely due to Saudi Iran reproachment. Former Israeli Prime Minister Yar Lapid, who now leads the opposition, the Knesset slammed Netanyahu's government and said the Saudi Iran deal signals the collapse of the regional defense wall that will st- we start building against Iran. This is what happens when one detail with its legal insanity all day instead of doing its job against Iran and strengthening relations with the United States. And so I think what Lapita is saying is that his issue is more that uh, Netanyahu, the leader, current leader of Israel, isn't interested in doing more right now against Iran is concerned more about his legal issues and the reform in Israel. My, I wonder, actually, if it isn't the hawkishness of Israel and Washington and maybe Saudi Arabia saw this as a way to prevent a war from breaking out in the Middle East between Israel and Iran because there's no way Saudi Arabia doesn't get caught in the middle of that and doesn't uh, suffer pretty heavily from from that kind of conflict. Uh, so just to wrap up Dave's article here, the day before the Iran-Saudi deal was announced, the Wall Street Journal reported that Saudi Arabia was asking for U.S. security guarantees to help start a nuclear program as a part of agreement for Riyadh to normalize its ties with Israel. So I wonder if maybe uh, the U.S. had rejected that. Saudi Arabia wants essentially an unmonitored uh, nuclear energy program provided to it by the United States. I think they want the, uh, the to be able to enrich their own uranium, and, and that would give them the capability to develop a nuclear weapon over time. And I, I think that's why 
Washington has been pretty hesitant to do it. I think they were looking at doing something um, like they did with the the UAE. It was called a one two three agreement where. Uh, you know, the, the nuclear reactors are in these countries, but the, you know, nuclear fuel produced from the nuclear reaction wouldn't be left. It would be sent back to the United States to be enriched, turned into fuel rods or, or other nuclear fuel, stuff like that. Uh, and, and they wouldn't have the capabilities in, in those countries. And Saudi Arabia, I think, want, wants more than that. They want to have basically... Uh, whatever kind of nuclear program they want, and they want the U.S. to provide it, which I, I don't think is going to happen. So last up here, one more article. Report U.S. airstrikes in Somalia killed seven civilians in January. According to the monitoring group, Air Wars suspected U.S. airstrike killed seven civilians, including three children, in Somalia on January 30th. Air Wars cited media reports from three news outlets um, local residents said the strike took place between two villages near uh, the Al-Shabaab controlled areas in the in the south of Somalia. U.S. AFRICOM command did not report the airstrike on January 30th, but it's not clear the command is reporting each strike it launches. And so this kind of confirms what I've been saying on the show for months and months and months is that Whenever you actually look into these airstrikes, it turns out they kill civilians, even though the Pentagon says, oh, you know, we just killed a bunch of terrorists in Al-Shabaab, which isn't true. Anyways, that's where I'm wrapping up the show for today. Hope everybody enjoyed it. I will be back with more shows later in the week. Please share it out uh, wherever you can help this show to grow.